Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Bite Size Talk. I'm very happy to have Phil here, who is uh, talking today about converting Python scripts into packages for PyPy, Bioconda, and BioContainers. Um, so it's your stage, Phil. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me today. I'm going to have a little bit of fun together, hopefully. <laughs> um, Today's talk was inspired by a conversation that's come up a, a few times within NFCore, which is um, when people have got scripts within a pipeline, so typically within a bin directory or could be within the exact uh, shell block of a, um, of a process. And instead of bundling that, um, that script with the pipeline, we instead prefer to package that scripts um, or set of scripts as a standalone um, software package instead. And there are a few different reasons why we like to do this. Um, firstly, it, so it makes the package and the, the analysis scripts available to anyone to use, even if they're not using Nextflow and not using this pipeline. So that's kind of but a greater good of a community. More reusability, more visibility. Um, it can sometimes help with licensing um, because we're no longer bundling and modifying code under potentially a different license within the NF core repo. So the NF core repo can be MIT and can just call this external tool. Um, and it also helps with software packaging as, as Van mentioned. <clears throat> so um, for free, then we get um, a Docker image, um, singularity image, a Conda package with all of the different requirements that you might need. So you don't need to spend a long time thinking about all the different you know, setting up custom Docker images and all this kind of stuff. You just package your own scripts as its own standalone tool and you get all of that stuff for free so much better and, and all the maintenance can kind of sit alongside the pipeline rather than integrated into the pipeline so it's a nice thing to do uh, and for me the main the main reason is that first one which is that it makes the tool more usable for anyone and uh, not necessarily tied to running within Nextflow, uh, which i think is great because it's nice to use tools on a small scale and then scale up to using uh, a full-size pipeline when you need it so um I've told people in the past that this this is easy, <laughs> which it is if you've done it lots of times before. But uh, I thought it's probably time to put my money where my mouth is and actually uh, show show the process and hopefully convince you to that it isn't isn't so bad. Now, a few things to note before I kick off. Firstly, um, I'm going to live code this. I haven't run through it earlier, so I've got a, a finished example on my side, which you can't see, which I will copy and paste from occasionally, um, and hopefully refer to if everything really goes wrong. But in the words of SpaceX, excitement is guaranteed <laughs> because uh, something will blow up at some point. Um, so join me on that. Secondly, uh, there are many, many ways to do this. Um, my, my way is not necessarily the same as what I'm going to show. Uh, and there are better ways to do things and probably recommendations that you should listen to from other people that are much better than mine. My aim today is to try and show you the easiest way to go from Python scripts to something on uh, Bioconda. And, uh, and I want to try and make that beginner friendly and kind of as bite sized as possible. Um, so let's start by sharing my screen up here. And uh, we will kick off I'll spotlight my, my my screen for everybody so hopefully you can still see my face um and yeah so to start off with the, the famous xkcd comic about python environments which are famously sort of uh complicated packaging environments so we're going into something which is known for being difficult and varied but that's fine we're going to keep it as simple as possible and you don't need to worry about all this stuff um so I've got a little little toy Python script here. Um, it doesn't do very much. It just does a, makes a plot. And uh, I wanted some kind of input. So it takes a, a text file here, delete that now, uh, called title.txt with some text in it. It reads that file in, um, sets it as a variable, and sets the plot title to uh, whatever it found. And then it saves it. Um, so this is our starting point. I can, I can try and run this now. So if I do Python analysis.py there we go we've got our plot and my nice plot so it works first step so I'm, this is where i'm assuming you're starting off is you have a, a python script which works um so we have a few objectives to do to take this script into a standalone python package firstly we want to as far as possible uh make things uh 
kind of optional and, and variable. So instead of having a fixed file name with a, with a string like this, we want a better way to pass this information in to the tool. So we want to build the command line tool. Uh, we want to make it available ideally anywhere on the commands, the command line on the path. Uh, so make it into a proper command line tool rather than a script, which you have to call using Python. Um, so and we can call it you know, my analysis tool or whatever and run that wherever. Um, and once we've done all that stuff, we want to package it up uh, using Python packaging so that we have everything we need to push this package onto the Python package index. And we're going to focus on that. Um, once we've got this as a tool on PyPy, um, where anyone can install it, then the steps from PyPy to Conda uh, is fairly easy. And once it's on Conda, you get by containers for free, which is the Docker image and the Singularity image. So really, our destination for today is just Python, Python, Python packaging dips, the PyPy. There's another talk fairly old by now, but it's still to totally valid by Alex Peltzer on NF Core Bite Size, uh, which takes you from uh, that Bioconda packaging steps. Um, so you can kind of follow on this, this talk with that one. Right. Hopefully that makes sense. So first steps first, let's try and make this into a command line tool. Now, there are a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, Probably the, the classic Python library to do command line passing is called argpass, which many of you may be familiar with. Uh, personally, I've tended to use another package called click. And more recently, I am tending to use a package called typer, which is actually based on click. Uh, so if I just use the right browser, this is URL, typer.tagler. Gosh, it's quite big. Um, on a bigger screen, it looks. <laughs> I just make my window bigger just for a second so not reading anything here but just seeing what the website really looks like it's got a really good website uh, it explains a lot about how to use it and uh, you can kind of click through the, the tutorial here and it tells you about everything that what's happening why it works and the way it does and, and how to build something so we can start off with this the simplest example um, and we're going to say import typer here so go up to the top import oops Type uh, wrap our code in a function name. Ah, why I can't copy from the VS Code browser apparently. So I'm going to indent all of this code. That way. Um, and then I'm going to copy in that last bit, which was there, my other window. Uh, down at the bottom. So what's happening here? I'm importing a Python library called Typer, which is what we're using for the command line tool. I've put everything into a function, um, which is just called def main. And then at the bottom, I've said if name equals main. So this is telling Python, if this script is run directly, use Typer to run this function. Uh, if I save that, now I can do Python analysis uh, and nothing will happen. It should just work exactly the same. But I can do Python analysis help. And you can see we're starting to get a command line tool come in here. Right, next up, let's get rid of this file. We don't really care about it being in a file. That was just a convenience. So I'm going to say, let's instead pass the title as a command line option. And in, with Typer, we just do that by adding a, um, a, a function argument to this function. And I can get rid of this bit completely. And to prove it, I'll delete that file as well. Um, so let's try again. Do Python analysis minus minus help. And sure enough, now we have some help text saying, hey, there's a expecting a title, which is text, and we have no default. And if I try and run it without any arguments, it will give me a nice error message. Um, and now if I say hello there, it's passed that into there. And hooray, our plot now has a different title. Right. So that is our first step complete. We have a rudimentary command line interface, and we have got rid of that file, and we've now got command line options, which makes it a much more uh, usable, flexible tool. And that was not a lot of code, I think you'll agree with me. Um, so you can do with, with Typer, you can do many more things. You can obviously add lots more arguments here. You can say it should be a, an integer or a Boolean, um, and it will craft the command line for you. Uh, you can use options instead of arguments, so minus, minus, whatever. You can set defaults. You can write help text. Loads of stuff like that. 
So as you, your tool becomes more advanced, maybe you dig into the type of documentation a little bit and learn about how to do that, but that's beyond the scope of today's talk. Okay, um, next up, let's think about how to make this into an installable package and something we can run on the command line anywhere. And those two things kind of go together. Um, now, if someone else comes and wants to run this package, they're gonna need to be able to import these same Python packages. So I'm gonna start off by making a new file called requirements. Dot txt, and I'm going to take these package names there and just oops, pop them in there. We'll come back and use that in a minute. Um, in the short term, if someone wanted to, they could now do pip install minus r requirements dot text, and that would install all the requirements for this for this tool. Um, what else am I going to do? I'm going to start moving stuff into some subdirectories. Um, by convention, I'm going to put it into a directory called source, but it doesn't really matter. You can call it whatever you want. And I'm going to call it my tool. And I'm going to move that Python file up into that directory there. I'm also going to create a new file called underscore underscore or dunder init underscore underscore dot pi. This is a weird looking file name and it's a special case. Uh, by doing this in Python, it tells the Python packaging system that this, uh, this folder, this directory, behaves as a Python module, which is what we want to install later. Um, so I can write, add a doc string at the top saying my amazing tool. And I'm actually going to not put anything in here for now apart from a single variable, which I'd put here by convention, but really you can do whatever you want. Um, and I'm going to call it, again, use Dunder, uh, so double underscore version, double underscore. And we'll say minus you know, semantic version like 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0.1 <laughs> dev. And we'll, again, we'll come back and use this variable a bit later, but for now it doesn't do anything. Um, what else? We want to make the type of example slightly more complicated. Um, we're going to now actually create a type of app like this. We're going to get rid of this bit at the bottom because we don't actually need that anymore. If we're not going to be running it as a script, we're not going to be calling that Python file directly. I get rid of that and we're going to now use a python decorator called app command here to tell the typer that this is a command now to be used uh, within the command line interface this is a normal secondary step the first very simple example is so simple that you almost never use that with typer this is basically what you always do and then you can have multiple functions here decorated with command and you can have multiple sub commands within your cli using that way and groups of sub commands and all kinds of things so with NF core, we have group sub commands. You do NF core module updates, for example, and those are separate kind of sub commands. So that's how you do it here. But for now, this would work in exactly the same way as the example I showed you a second ago. Um, okay, I'm gonna add, uh, because this is gonna be a Python package, it's really important to tell everybody about how to use it. So I'm gonna write, uh, create a new license file. A uh, fan of MIT, so I'm going to make it the MIT license and just paste in the text there that I've grabbed off the web. And I'm going to make a README file because this is going to turn up on um, on GitHub. So we want people to know about what the tool is and how to use it when they see the repo. Okay, hopefully you're with me. Um, that's all the kind of simple stuff. Now we get onto the slightly more complicated bit about how to take this and make it installable. And this is one of the bits where it gets very variable about how you can do it. Um, typically within Python, you can use uh, a range of different kind of installable Python packages to do your Python packaging. It's quite meta. Uh, there's a very old one called distutils, which you shouldn't use. Um, there's one called setup tools, which is most common. And that's what I'm going to use today. Uh, other people like packaging setups, such as one popular one called poetry. Um, there are quite a lot of them. So if you have preference, great, go for it. And maybe in the discussion afterwards, people can suggest their favorites. Um, but for now, I'm going to stick with setup tools and I'm going to say setup.py, um, which again, this gets a bit confusing, but you don't necessarily need, and setup.cfg. Uh, I should dump in here. You don't need to remember how to do this. I don't remember how to do this. I don't think anyone really remembers how to do this. If I do uh, some browsing, type in setuptools.pypa, IO, you can see there's quite good docs on this website for setup tools, and they tell you how to do everything. They talk through it, it's quite easy to read actually, and they also talk through all the different options of how to build this stuff. Uh, you can do it with what's called a pyproject.tumble files, which is probably what I'll start doing soon. 
uh, when it becomes slightly more standard. Uh, there's a setup.cfg file, which is what I'm going to do now. And there's also some documentation about the old school way of doing it, which is setup.py. For now, the setup.py file is just for backwards compatibility. And I'm going to do exactly what it tells me to do here. I'm going to say support setup tools, setup, save. And then I just forget about this file and never look at it again. Then everything else goes into a setup.cfg file. And uh, you can kind of work through the examples here. For now, I'm going to cheat for the sake of time and copy in what, here's what I did earlier. Um, and just walk you through what these keys are quickly. Again, I always copy this from the last project I did, um, but you can copy it from the web very easily. Um, name is important. Um, version is important because when you're updating a Python package, it needs to know which version number it is. And this then is using the special variable I set up here. Now, if you look where it is, it's in the Python module I made called my tool, and it's dot, uh, the, the variable number is underscore underscore version. And so here I'm saying, use an attribute. I could hard code it in this file if I wanted to, but I'm using it as an attribute and I'm using this variable, which is under my tool, underscore, underscore version. You could call that whatever you want, or you could just hard code it in this file. Um, author, description, keywords, license, license files, uh, long description, say it's markdown. That's just what shows on the, the PyPy website. Uh, classifiers, which are just sort of categories. I basically always copy these without thinking. Um, you can probably think a bit more about it if you want to. Um, and then some some slightly more interesting stuff down here. The minimum required version of Python, which might be important for you. Uh, where you put your source code. In this case, I say look for the, any packages you can find, any Python modules you can find, and look in the directory called source. So if you call that something different, you put that here. And then that's looking for basically .init files like that. And then saying we require a bunch of other Python packages here. And here I'm saying look at this file called requirements.txt. Um, and again, if you didn't want to have that file for whatever reason, you can also just list them in this file here as well. Um, and then finally, console scripts. This is the bit which actually makes it into a command line tool. Um, and here we say, I want to call my tool my awesome tool. Um, and I find what when I someone types that into the command line, what I want Python to do is to find the module called my tool, which we've created here with the init file. Um, I've actually got this script called analysis here. Again, this file name could be whatever you want. And then look for a, a function called app. And then here, I've, or sorry, a variable called app. Here, our variable is called that. I could also put a function name and stuff here as well if I wanted to. The typo, I'm going to say dot app. Okay, so now Python will know what to do when I install my tool. And moment of truth. Let's try and install it and see what breaks. So pip, Python package index uses uh, pip. And I'm going to say pip install. Now I could just do full stop for the, the um, current environment. So my current working directory, and that will work. But I'm actually going to add minus E flag here for editable. What that does is instead of copying all the files over to my Python installation directory, it soft links them. And that's really useful when developing locally because I can make edits to this file, hit save, and I don't have to reinstall the tool every single time. So I just am always in the habit of using minus E basically pretty much all the time. And then let's see what happens. <laughs> Break. Setup not found. That's because I got the import wrong. Right, sorry, from setup tools, import setup. And then set up search yeah, and I could have done set up like that. That should work as well. Let's try again. Great. You can see it's running through all those requirements. It's installing all the backend stuff, which is like matplotlib and, and typer and stuff, and it installed. So now, what did I call it? My awesome tool. If I do my awesome tool minus minus help. Hooray, it works. Look at that, we've got a command line tool. Uh, and now I can run this wherever I am on my system. I don't have to be in this working directory anymore. doesn't matter um, if I make, do an example, make the testing, CD testing. Um, and then if I do my awesome tool, uh, this is a test. 
there we go. Now we've got that file created in there because that was my working directory. And sure enough, we've got a nice title. Brilliant. Okay, so we have a command line tool. It installs locally, it works, and it's got a nice command line interface. We're nearly there. Uh, the final thing then is to take this code and um, put it, publish it, put it onto the Python package index. Now, again, if you start digging around on Google, you will find instructions on how to do this, and it will say run a whole load of command line functions, um, run those, do this, and that will publish it. And there's like a sandbox environment where you can test first, and you have to sign up to PyPy, obviously, and, and register and, and create a project and everything. But what my recommendation is to keep things simple, and it's the only way I do it now, is to do all of this through GitHub Actions and automate your public, pub, uh, public uh, automate the publication of your package. And that's all I'm going to show you today because I can I can walk you through that quite easily, and it's the same logic. So uh, if you've not used GitHub Actions before, the way it works is you create a directory called uh, GitHub dot GitHub, so it's a hidden directory, and a subdirectory called Workflows. And then in here, I'm going to create a new file, which can be called anything, uh, deploypypy.yaml. And then I'm going to cheat and copy, because otherwise it's going to take me a while to type all this in. But I'm going to walk you through it. So this is the YAML file that tells GitHub Actions what to run and when to run it. Uh, we have a name up here, which can be anything. And firstly, we have a trigger. And this tells GitHub, run this GitHub Action whenever this repository has a release and the, the event type is published. So basically, whenever you create a new release on GitHub and you click release, publish, uh, this workflow will run. And it'll run on a default branch. Um, then we have the actual, the, the meat of it. What's it. What is it actually doing? It's running on Ubuntu. It's checking out the source code first and setting up Python. Now, I install the dependencies manually here. I'm not totally sure if this is actually required or not, but it was in the last GitHub Actions that I did, so I thought I'd do it again. Um, first command is just upgrading pip itself and setting up setup tools and stuff. And then we do the pip install dot command again, just to install whatever's in the current working directory. So now on GitHub Actions, your tool is, is installed. And then we run this uh, Python command with setup.py, which is just calling setup tools and saying sdist, so setup tools distribution and create a bdist wheel. You don't need to know what that means or why it's there, but that's just the files that the Python package index needs. So now it's built the distribution locally. And then finally, we publish it to, <laughs> you can see where I copied it from. <laughs> we, we publish it to the Python package index. Uh, this is a check just to make sure if anyone has forked your repository, um, don't bother trying to do this because it obviously it won't work. So I usually just put this in, check if your GitHub repository is called whatever, and then use this Python package index action, which is a GitHub action that someone else has written. Um, and with, and here I'm using a password, and this is a GitHub action secret. And this is an API token that you can get from the Python package index website when you're logged in. And that gives you, gives the GitHub actions all the credentials it needs to be able to publish the, the Python package for you. And that's it. If everything works well, you stick all this on GitHub, um, you make it all lovely, you hit release, and then you will be able to watch that workflow running and it will say workflow published. Remember to change this version when you run it more than once, because if you try and publish the same package twice with the same version number on Python package index, it will fail. But as long as you bump that, then everything sort of should work and you should end up with a package on, uh, on PyPy. And when you have that package, uh, you'll be able to do name. Uh, that's, I think that's what Python package index uses. So you'll, do, you'll be able to do pip install my tool from anywhere. Anyone will be able to do that and it will just work. And that's it. And then at that point, you can pat yourself on your back, think how amazing a job you've just done is and how anyone can now use your analysis tools, uh, prepare yourself for an onslaught of bug reports to GitHub <laughs> uh, and take the next step and scaffold that PyPy uh, recipe into uh, Bioconda and do all the last stuff. But like I say, that's in a different talk. Um, so I'm not going to swamp everyone by talking about that too much today. Right, hopefully that made sense to everybody. Um, shout if you have any questions and, and I'd love to hear what workflows other people have and whether I made a mistake and you think I should do it in a different way and if your way is better. <laughs> Thank you so much.
uh, it's nice to see how some of the magic actually happens in the background. <laughs> so uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, I, I got one. Have you um, have you tried cookie cutter and to automate all of this? Yeah, I when I was prepping this with like five minutes to go, I was desperately trying to find a link for a really nice project, which I've seen and I've spoken to the authors and I cannot remember the name of it um and uh is but there's a few of them floating around but there's one yeah. definitely for bioinformatics where you can do use a cookie cutter project and it creates scaffolds an entire python package index project for you with all of this stuff in place and it's probably much better and quicker but um i purposefully chose not to show that kind of thing today because i was thinking of going from someone who already has a script which is working through and trying to kind of explain what all the different stuff is doing but yeah if you're starting from scratch i would absolutely do that and if anyone has any good links for, for projects or can remember the projects I'm talking about, please post them here or in Slack. And um, so, yeah. I'll just drop the link in the chat if someone yeah. doesn't know what we're talking about. So, so that, that's for, so that links for Cookie Cutter itself, yeah. right? Which is just like a generic templating tool. Yes. Um, there are Cookie Cutter projects which people have created, like template repositories, specifically for Python, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. We do have another question in the chat. Um, someone is asking, why not pyprojects.tomo? Yeah, so <laughs> oh, this is something else I was debating on the start. So this is a bit of history here. When I started creating my first Python uh, projects, you always used that setup.py file, and you still can. Um, and it's a bit like how Nextflow config files are just a groovy script where you can do whatever you like. Setup.py is the same. It's just a Python script where you can do whatever you like which is wonderful and horrifying. Um, <laughs> so slowly over the last, like Python community moves slowly. So over the last many years, uh, there's been a move away from that way of doing things into more standardized file types. And there are two which are being used. There's a setup.config file, which is basically exactly the same thing, but in a structured file format. Um, and the other one is pyproject.toml, which is the newer and, and better way of doing things. Pyproject.toml is nice because it's also, um, a standard for many other Python uh, tools with configs. So if you want to use black to lint your code, which you should, because black is amazing, you'll put your settings in pyproject.toml. If you use, I don't know, MyPy for type linting or any of these kind of flake eight tools or whatever, any of these linting tools and stuff, they all stick their settings in pyproject.toml, which is great because you have one config file for everything to do with your Python project, which is much nicer. And you can also do all of your setup, um, setup tools, Python, stuff in there there are a couple of things which i found i think are missing correct me if i'm wrong i don't think you can point it to a requirements.txt file for all the requirements and it's quite useful having that file sometimes um maybe it doesn't matter uh and it's also i think the setup tools website says it's like in beta and it might change so i thought i'd play it safe today and go for setup.cfg which is newish but sort of fairly safe um and uh but yeah pyproject.tom uh, is, is if, if you can make it work for you, is probably a nicer way to do it. Uh, we have some more comments. So um, there was a link posted to Moritz's cookie cutter package, um, which has not been tried out, at least not by the person uh, <laughs> who, uh, who posted it. And it says, ironically, Flake 8 can't actually work with settings from pyproject.toml, or at least couldn't a couple of months ago. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Cookie Cutter, this uh, it might look familiar to anyone who's used the NF Core template. We used to use Cookie Cutter for NF Core back in the early days, uh, and still use the underlying framework, which is called Ginger. So that's where this double squiggly brackets comes from. It's a templating system, um, and you can see in here you've got all these different settings uh, there for license options and a name and stuff, and then these will go into all these double bracket things. So the idea is you do Cookie Cutter run. Uh, or cookie cutter, I can't remember what the command is now, build. And you give it this GitHub URL and it will ask you a few questions which will just replace these defaults here. Um, and then it will basically generate this package here, but with all the template uh, placeholders filled in. Great, do we have any more questions? It doesn't seem so. So thank you very much for this great talk.
Um, like on the Slack channel. <laughs> yes. Before we um, wrap this up entirely, I also have a um, something to mention. So next week's bite size talk is going to be one hour late. I will also post this again in uh, the bite size channel. And very interestingly, this will be um, from a there will be a talk from uh, people that were part of the mentorship program. So the, the deadline for the mentorship project program just got extended. So it's actually uh, for anyone who is still questioning if they should join or not, uh, this is your chance to actually listening to people who have been part of it and uh, they give some impressions. Um, so with this, I would like to thank Phil again. I would like to thank everyone who listened again. And um, of course, as usual, I would like to thank the John Zuckerberg Initiative for funding our talks. And um, have a great week, everyone.